Good morning, everyone. I'm Gail Hogan, and I will be your moderator for the webinar this morning. If this is your first time joining us, the purpose of this webinar series is to give you the data, the facts, and answers as we know them today, and to help you better protect your employees, customers, and your businesses during COVID-19. Today's focus, an update on COVID-19 vaccine safety and efficacy. So let's get started. A few details here. All attendees, with the exception of our speakers, are muted. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website. And throughout the webinar, you may submit questions to our experts through the question and answer feature in Zoom, and we will get to those a little later in the webinar. Let me introduce you to our experts from the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Dr. Andy Thomas is the Chief Clinical Officer and Senior Associate Vice President for Health Sciences at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Dr. Thomas has worked on the front lines leading Wexner Medical Center's response and management of COVID-19. Dr. Nora Colburn is an Assistant Professor of Medicine and the Medical Director of Clinical Epidemiology at the Ross Hart Health Hospital. Dr. Colburn is part of the team of infectious disease physicians addressing the safety of the COVID-19 vaccine. We look forward to learning more from her shortly. Dr. Peter Moeller is Chief Scientific Officer and Vice Dean for Research at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center and the College of Medicine. Dr. Moeller is directing COVID-19 based research for the Wexner Medical Center. So let's begin with Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas, welcome. And we have made a shift from testing to vaccinating. Good morning. Can you highlight the latest data for us? I would be happy to, Gail. And thanks again for being here uh, uh, today uh, with, our, uh, with our team and with our guests uh, uh, with this session. So I want to touch base uh, just on two things. First of all would be uh, case rates. Uh, and as we proceed as a state towards uh, moving to rescinding uh, some of the public health orders and getting a little bit, quote, back to normal, unquote. Just to give an update on that, then we talk a little bit about vaccinations and where we stand uh, as a state. Um, so what the, the slide that's, uh, can you, I assume, Gail, you can see this, the slide on the screen? Perfect. The, uh, the, what that slide shows is a county by county map looking at case rates of 100,000 case, or uh, case rates per 100,000 citizens um, over the previous two weeks. So the, the governor announced, I believe now it's two weeks ago, uh, that once the state uh, reaches 50 cases per 100,000 individuals statewide over that two week period, that they will rescind uh, the state public health orders. And just to remind you, as we went up the curve of cases, we talked a lot about 100 cases per 100,000 being the CDC definition of high incidence for any locality, city, county, uh, state, et cetera. So, um, at our worst case rates, we reached over 700 cases per 100,000 uh, as a state. So 7X, the, the, the high incidence rate. So even though right now we feel really good about the trajectory of our cases in the state, when you look at where we are compared to maybe where we were last summer, uh, when we were under 100 as a state, this week we're at 143 cases per 100,000 over the last two weeks. Now, good news, that's down from 155 down from 177 two weeks ago. Uh, but like I said, we were over 700 just a few months ago. So the good news is almost all of our counties are in that kind of yellow to orange. So if you look at the scale on the left, you know nobody's up in this orange red uh, area, but we really wanna get down to that 50 per 100,000 case rate. Now this looks county by county. Uh, now the good news here, if you look at the far right, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but if you look at the far right, we now have six counties that are at basically 53, I'll, I'll round down to 50, six counties that are at that um, less than 50 cases per 100,000 rate. Two weeks ago, we had one, it was Holmes County, which is a large Amish population and, and just has low, low rates, uh, has had low rates uh, uh, in general. Now, the good news is two weeks ago, we had only eight counties that were under 100 uh, per 100,000. And this week, if you once again round down from like this uh, 103, 104 range, we now have nearly 30 counties of our 88 counties that are under that 100 per 100,000 rate. Now, the bad news is we still have, uh, you know, seven that are over 200 cases per 100,000, but on average, the state's moving in the right direction. Um, I think it's difficult to determine when we're gonna get to that 50 uh, rate, but I know many of you as employers are very interested in that, so you can get back to maybe some no more normal operations at work or 
not need masks if you're a, a, a customer facing uh, organization, those sorts of things. I think we're still a few months away from that. Uh, it's difficult to put a date on it. Obviously, the more people we vaccinate, uh, uh, get to that in a second, the, the better off we're, we're going to be. But at, at this time, there's really two sets of mitigation. There's all the things that we've been doing with masking, distancing, hand washing, avoiding large crowds, as well as vaccine. Those two things together are going to be what gets us to, to 50. Now, the other good piece of news, uh, I think, is that, frankly, uh, oh, this is our this is our case rates. Uh, so that each blue bar is our daily reported case rate. The blue line is our seven-day moving average of of, uh, of cases uh, in the state. So you know, once again, I like that blue line going that that direction. Now, the, the the real good news here is that we're not the state of Michigan, which it's good news for many reasons that we're not a state, the state of Michigan. I know Bob Tannis hates the state of Michigan. Know, uh, he's he's on the call. Um, but uh, I, I, then again, I like to root for University of Michigan, except for when we're playing them, so they're undefeated when we beat them. But that being said, uh, Michigan's seeing the exact opposite trend. This is what their data looks like. Um, they are actually going in the wrong direction um, uh, in terms of their seven-day moving average of cases. Uh, if you look at just the news headlines coming out of Michigan, I think a lot of folks up there are showing concern. So when we think about the fact that state borders you know, are very porous, obviously like county borders are porous, right? So in those counties we have in Ohio where we're at 200 cases per 100,000, those people go to the mall or go to church or go to work in counties that are at 70 per 100,000. So we need to all stick to our mitigation efforts with masking, distancing, avoiding large crowds, et cetera, while we try and vaccinate as quickly as we can. So whether it's people from Michigan driving to Ohio to go to church or go to the mall, or whether it's people from a rural county going to an urban county, whatever it might be, we all need to stay on guard for this so that we don't become Michigan. Um, and I'll a break for a second to, towards vaccinations. This is the state's data through yesterday. We now vaccinated as first dose about two and a half million people. It's about 22% of the state has gotten at least one dose. Now, if you take out those under age 16 that aren't even eligible uh, to get vaccinations, it's probably well over 25% of the population. The good news is if you look down at these age groups, we're starting in these folks that have been getting vaccinated now since mid-January, right? The over 80 started uh, January 18th. You know, we're approaching that 70% mark where many of us have thought between people who've had it and have innate immunity plus vaccinated, you start to get to herd immunity at that 70 to 80% type range. For these folks that have been offered vaccine now going on the last couple of months, we're approaching that 70% range. Now our, our tough spot, and this is where we need all of you to be kind of part of our army to educate your, uh, your employees about the importance of vaccination. When you look at 20, 30 and 40 somethings who haven't had the opportunity to get vaccinated yet, but will starting March 29th, we need to do everything we can to encourage those people to be, to be vaccinated. Uh, just to, to uh, recap what the governor announced earlier this week. So actually starting today, uh, individuals age 40 to 49, as well as some new disease groups, including uh, people with obesity, people with chronic kidney disease, uh, people with cancer, people with heart disease, are all eligible to be vaccinated starting today. And then a week from Monday on the 29th, uh, essentially it opens up with no restrictions to anyone over age 16. Uh, the J&J vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine are for 16 and up, and the Moderna vaccine is for 18 and up. So if you do have that uh, a child or a, a, probably not a, a worker in your company, but you might, who's uh, over 16, between 16 and 18, they need to find uh, either a Pfizer or J&J site to, to get vaccinated. But as we open up uh, to all uh, uh, the state, it's going to become an issue probably four to six or eight weeks from now where we're going to go from this high demand lower supply category to this really high supply. They're talking the week of the of March 29th, getting 100,000 additional doses that week compared to what we've been getting, which is about a 25% increase in our vaccine coming into the state in two weeks. So it'd be perfect timing when we see this surge of demand, but we're really gonna need as we move into the summer, the continued push for those 20, 30 and 40 somethings to that, that maybe aren't as motivated because the fact they know that they get less severe disease uh, we really need them all to get vaccinated. So when COVID is out there trying to go from person to person, it hits that brick wall of someone who's been vaccinated, not the Velcro of someone who isn't. It sticks to them and they get sick and then they are at risk of giving it to others. That's the whole concept of, of herd immunity. Now, a little bit about our vaccination program at Ohio State, and then I'll turn things back to Gail. Actually, huge. Uh, as soon as we finish uh, today on the webinar, I'm actually headed over to the shot 
around 11.30 this morning, we'll be celebrating our 100,000th dose of vaccine that we've administered at Ohio State. Uh, earlier this week, we crossed our total doses is 5x the seating capacity of the Schottenstein Center, which is amazing when you think about when that place is full to think we're at 5x. In fact, next Tuesday, we'll cross over the seating capacity of, of Ohio Stadium uh, for our, uh, our uh, vaccine effort. So we're really, really thrilled about that. Um, we do have a site also at OSU East Hospital. We're running clinics there uh, two days per week. Uh, the folks at OSU East Hospital that are being vaccinated are limited to 11 zip codes that are in underrepresented areas around the city, uh, near east side, downtown, near south side, and then up the kind of Cleveland Avenue corridor, where we're trying to do uh, additional outreach to immigrant groups. We're doing outreach to um, uh, uh, various populations in those uh, neighborhoods to, since that site's closer to them, to have them come and be vaccinated at East. Uh, we have translators on site for those that aren't English speaking, all sorts of things that, that um, we think will make it easier for some of the patients that have less access to healthcare and less access to the vaccine to get vaccinated. Obviously those individuals from those 11 zip codes obviously are also eligible to schedule at the shot, but because of transportation and other issues, they may be less likely to, uh, to get there. So we're quite proud of our rates at, at East have been over 50% uh, minority population, which uh, when you look at, at the shot, we're closer to between 10 and 15%. Uh, minorities uh, getting vaccinated. So a lot going on um, and uh, we continue to look forward to serving our community. Uh, over 70% of the first doses that we've uh, uh, done have actually been, you know, community members that, uh, that are not our employees, not our healthcare workers, uh, uh, those sorts of things. So we're excited about uh, serving, uh, serving our community. So with that, Gail, I'll turn things back to you. Dr. Thomas, I think it's great that you've been able to take some of that vaccine to the people. Um, for those that are going to the shot or other places, uh, quickly, is, are there any logistical? Um, in, is there any logistical information that some of these businesses sure. should know about to share with their employees? Sure. So, uh, if, if any of you've been to the shot before, uh, entrances at the northeast rotunda. So the parking's on the north side of the building. Uh, right along Boar Drive. Uh, there's ADA parking right next to the building. And then for folks who have no problem walking, there's parking just right across the street uh, uh, for folks. So you, the, the, the basic reality is once you get an appointment, uh, you bring a photo ID and a short sleeve shirt because it is a public space. You don't want to be able to undress. Uh, and then uh, plan to bring your calendar with you. We are getting mostly Pfizer. We've only gotten 300 total doses of J&J &J out of our 100,000 doses. So it's a small number, but those doses of J&J &J were gone within four hours when we offered them a couple of weeks ago on one day. They were just gone. Almost half the people that session chose the J&J, &J, which is a single dose vaccine. So, but given that you're probably going to get Pfizer, bring your calendar because during that 15 minute observation period, we will schedule your second shot uh, while you're there. Um, in terms of other logistics, just in terms of scheduling, I'll remind people if you are an OSU patient or any of your employees are OSU patients on their MyChart account, and their MyChart portal, they can go in anytime, 24 seven and look for available appointments. We are opening appointments routinely right now. We're booked out till I believe April 5th, but what we do in the future weeks is, so, so maybe deep in the weeds, but we got our allocation letter every Wednesday for the delivery the following Monday. But what we've been told by the state is you can count on 75% of your doses that you got last week for the next two weeks. So we've opened appointments further out on the calendar because we now have some assurances what we did want to do was schedule a bunch of people and not get enough vaccine and have to cancel patients. So um, each week as we get our vaccine allocation, we open that additional 25% of, of, uh, of appointments. So there's kind of a continuous churn of appointments being offered. Um, and then this week, for example, we found out that next uh, Monday night, we're going to get 20% more vaccine than we had last week. So now there's also an extra delta of new appointments that will be open starting uh, next Wednesday uh, for folks based on our increased allocation. So, um, there, there's, so the options for scheduling are my chart, calling our uh, or calling your OSU provider. Um, any of our scheduling team should be able to go in and see if there are appointments and get you scheduled, or call 614-688-VAX, V-A-X-X, 614-688-VAX, um, and you can get connected to a uh, to a scheduler, and they can also schedule you in for uh, for appointments. If you go into my chart and there aren't appointments available, there's also a wait list that you can ask to be put on. As appointments are open, then you'll get an email telling you that new appointments have been uh, have been opened. That's great information. Thanks, Dr. Thomas. My pleasure. Welcome, Dr. Colburn. Nice to have you with us today. And with your background in infectious disease, can you provide our viewers with some perspective relative to vaccine safety and effectiveness? So many questions around both of those. 
Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here uh, to talk about the vaccines, especially as I reflect on what I was doing a year ago. It is a very different day and I'm so excited. So um, can we start the slides? Or shall I share mine? There we go. Okay, next slide. So I'm gonna start with just a very uh, global view of the trial. So right now there are three vaccines that have emergency use authorization under the FDA in the United States. So they are Pfizer and Moderna. Those are both mRNA vaccines. And then Janssen, otherwise known as Johnson & Johnson. Um, this is an adenovirus uh, vaccine. So all three basically, um, get the blueprint, so to speak, for the spike protein into your cells that then cause your cells to make an immune response. So all of these trials, these were very large randomized control trials of 30 to 40,000 people were enrolled. So many, many people, um, basically people were divided into getting a placebo or the vaccine. Um, they were followed um, about for about on median uh, two months after their last vaccine. And then that data was reviewed and submitted to the FDA uh, for emergency use authorization. The endpoints for all of these trials were slightly different, although they all looked at symptomatic COVID-19 disease. Um, and what Pfizer looked at at least seven days after the second dose, whereas Moderna and Janssen looked at 14 days. And then Janssen had another endpoint of 28 days. Um, the enrollment sites, uh, Pfizer and Janssen, were um, all were across the were across the globe, including the United States, uh, South Africa, or South America, South Africa, and uh, Europe. Um, and then Moderna was just in the United States. And I also wanted to point out the enrollment time frame was slightly different. So Pfizer and Moderna enrolled from July through the fall of 2020, and Janssen was a little bit later, from September to January 2021. Um, okay, next slide. So what did they find? Um, I love statistics where you don't need to do a deep dive and it's very obvious. So on the left side of the screen, this is the Pfizer vaccine. And on the X axis, you see these are days, days after dose one. And on the Y axis, we have cumulative incidents. And you can see we have a very early departure. The blue line are COVID cases in patients who received placebo and the red line are COVID cases in patients who received the vaccine. And you see very quickly around day 10 to 12, you have a sharp departure where essentially the patients who got the vaccine had did not get any more cases of COVID, whereas the uh, patients who got placebo uh, did get cases and had the overall vaccine efficacy of about 95%. On the right-hand side, this is the Moderna vaccine, and it is very similar, if not almost identical. So again, shortly after uh, the vaccine was given, um, you see that there is a flat line of incidents and the patients who got the vaccine where the people got placebo were continuing to get, um, got COVID and the vaccine efficacy was about 94.1%. Uh, so essentially nearly identical uh, results in these two vaccines. Um, next slide. And so this is the results of the Janssen um, vaccine as well. And very similar, um, we see the red line as the incidence of COVID-19 and the patients who received placebo. And the blue line is for patients who received the vaccine, which is a much lower uh, incidence. So the overall efficacy globally was 66.3%. There was some geographic variability uh, with the lowest efficacy in South Africa, about 50%, and highest in the United States, about 74%. But what I really want to emphasize um, is on the right-hand side, if you could just advance one more to give me my red box there, the efficacy against COVID-19 related hospitalizations when they looked at greater than 14 days after their vaccine was 93.1%. And after 28 days after the vaccine, there were zero cases of patients who had to be hospitalized for COVID-19 and there were zero deaths related to COVID-19. So excellent efficacy against severe disease that required hospitalization and death. And these are really, this is huge. These, these are the metrics we're looking at. We want to protect people, keep them out of the hospital and save their lives. So next slide. So in terms of vaccine safety, so side effects are generally mild to moderate. They resolve in one to two days. And then we generally divide them into categories of local versus systemic. So local would be pain, swelling, redness at the injection site, localized lymph node swelling. Um, mRNA vaccines, about 80 to 89% of people will report at least one symptom, and about 50% of the Janssen patients reported at least one symptom. Um, again, these, these symptoms tend to be more pronounced at the second visit uh, or the second dose of the mRNA vaccines, and also we do see more in younger people compared to older people. 
In terms of systemic symptoms, fever, muscle, joint aches, headache, fatigue, chills, nausea, vomit, or diarrhea. Again, in mRNA vaccines, they were seen 55 to 83% of the time, and Janssen was about 55% of the time. Again, these are mild to moderate. They resolve in one to two days. Um, uh, and do, did not require attended care. I did want to take a point to talk about um, more severe reactions, which are quite rare, uh, but I think it's important to talk about so people have all the information. So this table on the right uh, was from a report in JAMA, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association, looking um, at, a, at the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, which is a database run by the CDC, uh, looking at all adverse events that follow vaccination. So they looked at almost 10 million doses of, vac of Pfizer vaccine and 7.5 million doses of Moderna and looked to see how many cases of anaphylaxis happened after that. And this is, uh, I'm gonna walk us through this table because it kind of really outlines who these patients were. So um, on their median age was about 39 to 41 years old. Um, looks like the majority of them were female. Um, and typically the reaction did happen, it looks if you'd go down to this uh, kind of middle line, uh, most of them happened within 30 minutes, which would be in the monitoring uh, period. And a significant portion of these people had reported allergies or allergic reactions in the past. And so part of our monitoring is we ask people if they've had a history of severe allergic reactions and those people are monitored for a longer period of time. And I wanna go down here to the very bottom. So the overall uh, anaphylaxis rate um, was 4.7% cases per 1 million doses in the Pfizer and 2.5 cases per million doses in the Moderna. And just to give you a reference point, the influenza vaccine anaphylaxis rate is about 1.3 cases per million. So a little bit higher, but again, these are very low rates, especially for the F compared to the benefit you get from the vaccination. And I do want to point out there are no deaths reported in the case of these anaphylaxis. These patients were all medically attended and did well. Next slide. So um, I also want to point out that there are several passive and active monitoring systems that are currently in place. So I'm listing some of these here. One is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS. Um, this has been an ongoing program by the CDC where um, if anybody has a uh, adverse event or issue, it, uh, the health provider will enter this into a database for VAERS so that the CDC can follow it. There's also several other uh, systems. One is the Vaccine Safety Data Link, or VSD. This is a, this is a large database of 12 in, uh, integrated health systems that report in data on 12 million people. And this is designed to look for statistically significant signals or trends. So this is constantly being looked at as more data comes in. As of February 13th, there were no statistically significant increased risks detected for any of the pre-specified outcomes. And there are many outcomes they look at, but some examples that I wanted just to emphasize were uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack, Bell's palsy, seizure, Guillain-Barre, encephalitis, myelitis, or blood clots. Um, so again, this is being looked at from a uh, very robust way, and there were no increased risks uh, as of uh, February 13th uh, during the report. Another um, safety system is the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project that is run by the CDC. So this is actually where clinical consultation is given if there are any complex safety issues. And then the latest one is vSafe. So if you've been to the, uh, have gotten your vaccine, you most likely have been encouraged to enroll in vSafe, which is, which is a text messaging platform where you can report symptoms directly to the CDC. Um, I wanted to point out, because I get a lot of questions about this. So far, there have been over 30,000 pregnancies reported to vSafe. So there's been an issue because the vaccines did not include pregnant women. Um, all are actively contacted to enroll in a formal pregnancy registry. And as of a report that was put out by the um, ACIP from the CDC, as of February 18th, there were no safety concerns that have been noted in pregnancy outcomes. Um, and they continue to follow these women and will continue to give um, updates and reports. Uh, next slide. So what are our take home points? Three vaccines are currently available in the United States under emergency use authorization. All have excellent 
uh, efficacy, particularly in regards to the prevention of hospitalization and death, and all with excellent safety profiles. As an infectious disease physician, I am thrilled with this data, and I'm also thrilled just as I reflect back of what we were doing a year ago, that we now have three vaccines um, that we can use. I think it's really important that we do have questions remaining, which is the um, extent of the duration of protection. Um, and the efficacy for asymptomatic transmission. So I'm hoping that data should be coming out soon. So that's why it's really important that we continue to wear masks, practice physical distancing, hand hygiene, and rapid isolation and testing if you develop symptoms. But getting vaccinated is huge. And I think we all need to encourage each other to get vaccinated as quickly as possible because that will decrease the community viral load and get us through this tunnel and into the light. So I'll pause there and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Dr. Colburn, thank you. I did want to remind everyone if they have questions for any of our experts on the webinar today, please um, submit those questions to the Q&A at the bottom of the screen here, and we will get to those a bit later. Um, Dr. Colburn, if you don't mind, I want to go back just to uh, the pregnancy question and see if you can verify or um, make a little more distinct. Are you, is, does the CDC want pregnant women to get the vaccine, or are they telling them, wait, we haven't decided yet if it's safe for pregnant women? No, so they, it is a conversation between the patient and her physician, but there is in no way a contraindication to pregnancy. Um, and it, it, because pregnant women are at risk for severe disease. Um, and so I, I would really urge if you have a risk of getting COVID to really talk to your physician, your, ob your obstetrician about getting vaccinated. And I'm thrilled that there has been no reports of any adverse events because these women were not in the clinical trials, unfortunately, so we don't have data. And there's no biological reason to suspect that there would be issues, and these are not live viruses, so we are not. there should be no, no risk to the fetus at all. The second question and follow-up, you had said on the second dose of the vaccine that many elderly people are not having adverse reactions. Do we know why? So in general, as we get older, um, it can be harder to elicit that immune response. Um, so sometimes patients who are older may not have that robust immune response that a younger person has, but I'm very pleased that in all of these studies, I didn't go into it in detail, but they saw excellent efficacy rates even in older people. So it's not like you're losing a significant amount, especially in the mRNA vaccines. Wonderful work. Dr. Colburn, thank you very much. Let's go to Dr. Moeller now. Dr. Moeller, uh, there's new variants that keep popping up and we keep hearing about them and it's not one or two and they seem to be multiplying and multiplying quickly. Can you give us an update on the variants and what we need to worry about with those? Sure, absolutely. And maybe just to follow up on one other, um, uh, two other points from, from what Dr. Colburn mentioned, um, two side effects that we're also seeing a lot over at the shot um, is um, people breaking out in smiles, as well as people with the desire to give high fives after they get their, their vaccine. So, so lots of good stuff happening. Um, and it's really fun to watch. And I don't know if Dr. Thomas would want to comment on this, but the, 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 the tears in people's eyes when they get vaccinated, it's really, it's really a cool time. So compared to where we were a year ago. So an update on the, um, on the variants, this has been in the news a lot, um, all of you don't want to spend your Friday morning listening to a scientist, so I'll be I'll be brief and, and want to give you some points. Um, viruses mutate, and we've known this for for a thousand years. Um, we have continued to see could the COVID nineteen virus continue to mutate, and it has mutated in ways that makes the virus um, much more capable of being spread between two different people. Um, but we continue to see the ability of masks to block this. We in Ohio, and in fact at Ohio State, have a very um, good group of researchers working on providing line of sight, not only to people here in Columbus, but really people across the state and across the country of what these um, COVID variants are. We have identified COVID variants, and in fact, I think a couple of webinars ago, we talked about this in detail of, of not only variants that are less concerning, but also some variants that are concerning. Um, there are variants that we know where we have potential risk, where the vaccines may not be 100% effective. But as of today, we feel very good that the three FDA approved vaccines, the Moderna, the Johnson and Johnson, and, um, and the Pfizer vaccines all show good efficacy 
for severe forms of COVID-19 or, or, or disease um, with the current vaccines. Now, we are still um, wanting to make sure that we have good data and are watching this literally on a daily basis. We watch every day at Ohio State and are sequencing every day um, positive cases that come in to see if there are new variants um, or are there variants of concern such as the ones coming from the United Kingdom, South Africa, or, or South America. So, so far so good. Um, we are seeing these. We're not seeing the rise that we would have predicted, but it's something that, you know, as, as Dr. Thomas mentioned, we're not, we're not out of the woods yet. We have to stay vigilant. Wearing masks helps. Um, making sure that we continue to observe distancing helps. Um, but so far, so good on the vaccines. Um, but we want to keep an eye on this. So, Dr. Moeller, when it comes to the masks and social distancing after you've been vaccinated, is that to protect from some of these new variants? Right. So, so I, my colleagues can can probably also chime in. But we still likely believe that even though you've been vaccinated, you still might be infected with with COVID nineteen, right? And so, and and while you may not be able to spread the virus like you could before, as long as you could before, very likely you still have risk. So, you know, whether you are um, vaccinated or not, you really should continue to wear your mask um, and to prevent and, and really look out for the people around you. And Dr. Colburn mentioned there's still research about the length of immunity. Have, have you and your research or other researchers gotten closer to figuring that out? Yeah, you know, it's 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 one of these um, areas that that we're really learning in real time. And that's why I would really encourage the folks that are on the call to continue to check back with this group and to ask questions of of this group. Um, there are every time you turn on the news or every time you look on the Internet, there might be 50 different myths out there about COVID-19. And, you know, people are nervous and people want to get back and people's Kids are starting to go back to school, so it's very natural for people to be asking questions. Um, we still feel very good about the safety of these vaccines. We still still feel very good about our diagnostics. Um, you know, Dr. Thomas didn't talk about the work with the monoclonals that's that's continuing to happening at Ohio State, but feel very good about the therapeutics. Um, with that said, we want to make sure that we don't get you know too positive. Um, and and you know get get nipped in the rear and so we want to you know we're going to keep and stay vigilant and um, keep focusing on evidence-based science and data um, and if people have questions outside of this of this forum that you're giving today um, gail we would encourage them to contact us and we're happy to provide information to individuals or patients or companies I'm going to invite all the experts back on. Dr. Moeller, stay right there. We're going to invite Dr. Colburn and Dr. Thomas back on to answer some questions from some of the folks who have been on this webinar. And here is one, and I'm not quite sure who, who would answer this, but do you feel there is any credibility to the theory that if you had a significant reaction to the first vaccine, you probably already had COVID? So I think I just answered that in the chat. Um, so at this point, we don't have data to say, oh, if you had these symptoms or this degree of reaction, you must have had it. Um, and I think it's also important to keep in mind that vaccination is recommended for all persons over 16, regardless of their past history of COVID infection. And uh, Dr. Thomas, I think I'm going to direct this one to you. Um, one of the business owners says, we have a relatively young workforce. How do we convince them to get the vaccine? All of our senior management have gotten it that are eligible, but even our 50 plus age group of blue collar workers are not signing up. Sure. Uh, we have this discussion a little bit within the university, right? How are we going to encourage? We have a lot of young people, right? How do we encourage them to get vaccinated? And a couple of things that, that we've thought about is certainly we're, we are not a proponent of the stick method, right? Which is, um, you know, do it or disciplinary action. We are not uh, proponents of mandatory vaccination and for a variety of reasons. Obviously, there is a certain subset of our population, rightly or wrongly, who who are not fans of vaccines. And that's been going on for a, almost a generation now. Um, and, and, and rightly or wrongly, and that's why herd immunity is not 99% of people being vaccinated as well. The science would say we don't need 100% of people vaccinated. So it's 
the, the marginal benefit you get by requiring someone who's, you know, dragging them to the table to get vaccinated probably doesn't help you in the culture of your organization. But there's a lot of carrots that you can do. So some of the things that we're talking about is obviously we do a lot of testing of our students that live in dorms. All right. We're trying to control the population. So if, if you've had two doses of the if you're fully vaccinated, so one, if it's J&J or two, if it's Moderna or Pfizer, um, if you do any testing at your organization, say those are people that don't need to get tested every week or every month or however often you're testing it. Even better yet, if they get vaccinated and they have an exposure to someone who turns out to be ill, they don't need to quarantine. They can come to work. They don't need to, you know, they're not putting their families at risk. I mean, there's all sorts of positive carrots that you can describe to your employees. Uh, the, 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 the interruption in their life that they can avoid if they have been vaccinated. Plus, of course, protecting their grandmother, protecting their neighbor who's on chemo, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, but if they're looking just even at self-interest, it's if you don't need to quarantine for 10 days or two weeks, next time your person two desks down makes a stupid decision and goes to a bar and comes in with COVID two days later, you know, that's a real benefit. So that's probably the, the way I would approach it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good advice. Thank you. Uh, I have a question on the variants, Dr. Moeller. Uh, have we seen that it depends on what vaccine maker you had, your vaccine, Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, that some are better equipped to tackle the newer variants than others? Right. So, so far, so far, and, and um, Dr. Colburn can, can also chime in here in a second, but, but so far we've had probably the best data in, in terms of people that have been vaccinated twice with the mRNA vaccines of the efficacy of against the, the, the variants. Where we're starting to see some, um, let me say it another way, where we need additional data is some of the emerging non-FDA approved vaccines such as the AstraZeneca. There are some, some data that still need to be filled in in terms of its efficacy for severe forms of, of COVID-19. So we have some evidence that it may not be as effective as some of the FDA approved ones, but those data sets are limited and they've been confined to some, some variants that are in South Africa mm -hmm. and some patients that don't have severe forms. And so again, as Dr. Thomas mentioned very early, our goal is to prevent, prevent severe forms of disease, hospitalizations, ventilators, death, we still believe that these vaccines um, that are either under development or FDA approved are going to be very effective at that. Um, where we need to fill in the data points are severe variants, such as the South African version, with some of the new vaccines that have not been approved. But I'll say this again, the ones that we have FDA approved, we feel very good at for the, the variants that are out there today. So people that are getting vaccinated the shot today or at St. John's Arena today, should feel very good. Okay, cool, thank you. Dr. Colburn, I have a question as we go into summer and we've had more people vaccinated, should the general public feel better about hugging their grandchildren and, and um, you know, what's the limit of what we should, what our comfort zone should be, especially as we go into the summer where we can be outside more with people who maybe are not vaccinated? So I think it's, I think we all should be optimistic, but I think we should be cautiously optimistic. So um, I think taking some baby steps is good. Um, you know, you know, CDC did release some guidance recently about how how vaccinated people can interact, and they specifically gave guidance of two households that are vaccinated can coming together, and it specifically gave an example of grandchildren and their grandparents, which um, I think has all been very welcome news. But I think we need to also be careful and. Um, you know, just from a, a as, as a personal anecdote, you know, I have an infant son and I am very, I'm very glad that my parents can interact with him, but I'm still very, being very cautious because I know that I want to protect both of them as much as I can. And just be, when I am going to see friends, we're going to sit outside, um, continue to use masking and physical distancing. Um, so we can kind of get the best of both worlds of having that great interaction with our friends and family, but also being as safe as we can. It's just, we learn more data and we can become more comfortable as time goes on. And here's another question too. And I've wondered about this vaccines for people under the age of 16. And then how far down do we go? Are we going to give three and four year olds vaccines? They don't seem to be at this point being infected, or at least they don't show very serious symptoms most of the time. 
I'm not sure which, who wants to answer this question, but it is interesting is how far down in the age we're going to go and when we would get there. So I know there are trials going on right now of um, preteens and teenagers, so 12 and up, and I believe um, Moderna is starting a trial of six months and tw to 12 years. Um, I don't know, Peter, if you have more to add on that. Um, no, I, I think just to say that trials are, are underway, I, I think one important point that, that maybe the three of us should make is when, as we move and get toward hum, uh, herd immunity and we want to get to herd, herd immunity, children are going to be a big part of that. So if we look um, globally um, in, and you know, to, to solve this, we're gonna have to think of this globally, 24% of the population is, is we would consider children. So we're gonna to have to get to a big chunk of that piece if we're going to achieve herd immunity, because there's gonna be a lot of people that are adults that may not be able to get the vaccine or, or don't wanna get the vaccine. And so it's, it's something that, you know, as we sort of check off the boxes and move to the next step, as vaccines become more, more available, you know, we, we need to get to those groups if, and I can, can, can continue to say if, and probably nodded heads by my colleagues, we can show that, that they're safe. And I think that's the key point is we have to show they're safe. We have to have thousands of kids in trials and, and children that are 18 are very different than children that are four. Right. Yeah, I have a 13 year old at home and he asks me every day. I know. Um, I, I did hear Dr. Fauci uh, on the news earlier this week, I believe talking about early 22 for children, but I, I do wonder if they're gonna have an interim step of saying like above age 12 or 13, and then you know, kind of maybe be a little more cautious on four or five year olds. And, and I do think part of it, when you think about the risk benefit relationship here, younger kids generally do okay with this, right? So the, the benefit to 80 year olds of getting a vaccine is huge, right? The benefit to four year olds is minimal so that you wanna make sure there's like no risks at all, right? So they're going to probably study that in younger, younger children even longer, but they may, there may be some interim step where the you know, teenager and above gets, gets some approval, but I, obviously that's not any study, Peter, that I know of that we are involved in currently. So um, I know Nationwide Children's was considering it, but I'm not sure if they've entered any of the trials or not. I have not heard confirmation of that. Dr. Thomas, I know you answered this in the Q&A, but I also wanted to put it out there because I've heard this as well, uh, that people who had COVID had a better immune response to the vaccine. Yep. Uh, yeah, is there a, a non-peer reviewed pre-publication article that came out of Mount Sinai, I don't know, Peter, was that maybe three weeks ago? Uh, looking at uh, antibody responses for people that were COVID naive uh, and getting two doses. And then for people who had had COVID documented, giving them one dose and watching what their antibodies do. And it's some, some preliminary evidence that there may be enough of an antibody response, but it is not at all kind of in the, it, it's not at the, the rigor and been reproduced by anyone else that I'm aware of at this point. Uh, Dr. Fauci, I've heard publicly because he's been asked this on news shows just said, wow, that would be great. Uh, you know, game changer in terms of access to vaccine if some people only need one dose. But it's kind of too soon to, to go that direction. It's not how these were studied. Um, and I think what the NIH is, I'm sure, going to do is, is delve pretty quickly into that data, try and get it reproduced by a, another site or by their own work. And then, uh, you know, so it's interesting, um, potentially a lead uh, to look at, but not ready for prime time. Bottom line, even if you had COVID, get the vaccine. Oh, completely get the vaccine. Uh, we do think the immunity wanes relatively quickly after 90 days is what kind of some of the studies have shown, but you don't know whether yours is waning or not. I mean, the, the, the risk of getting the vaccine is so low, uh, you should just go ahead and, and do it uh, because you don't want to be one of those people who thinks you're immune and you're not. We are closing in on our time uh, this morning. I want to thank you all for your valuable updates. And we look forward to more of this incredible progress and smiles on faces, Dr. Moeller, as more and more people get these vaccines. And Dr. Thomas, you've mentioned on previous websites and earlier today that Ohio State does offer service to employers and business leaders around COVID-19. Any advice uh, here today for them and where can they find more information? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I, our, uh, so if you're interested in more information, uh, we have certainly a, 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 our website has some of this, but uh, COVID-19 consulting at osumc.edu uh, is the email address that, that you should send any questions or queries to. Uh, we have a variety of services that we offer. Um, obviously, these are free webinars available to uh, broadly to the employer community here locally, statewide, nationally. Uh, but we do a variety of other consulting. 
Uh, we can certainly uh, be available by phone to answer your questions. Uh, uh, there's an hourly rate for that in terms of everything from how do you quarantine someone. You know, obviously, we want you to work with your local health department, but we're happy to give you advice on, on the safety of your workplace uh, in terms of how you set up uh, your operations, uh, even up to the point of actually coming out on site uh, and doing uh, tours. Uh, we do have a train the trainer program that right now is in beta testing, and we're looking to roll that out uh, more broadly where you can take uh, an individual could be from your HR or compliance, uh, however your organization is structured, and have them get trained up by our experts to be able to bring that expertise day to day um, into your uh, organization. And then I think, you know, we've done this with, with a handful of local companies where we've actually beamed into uh, company webinars or other, uh, uh, whether it's your executive team, whether it's a you know, broader set of managers or whether it's your whole firm, where we can beam in for a period of time and do essentially what we're doing here, but live taking your employees' questions, your leaders' questions about uh, any aspects of, the, of the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Obviously, we'd like to know ahead of time kind of what you're interested in hearing about so that we're positioning the right person to be there uh, uh, who has that knowledge base, because uh, as you can imagine, some of our folks are pretty sub, uh, subspecialized in what they do. But uh, that COVID-19 consulting uh, at osumc.edu is your kind of window into speaking with our administrative staff and they can uh, help meet your needs in whatever way uh, in terms of more information. Dr. Thomas, thank you. I'm sure everybody wants you to beam in. <laughs> you like Star Trek, just go with all the information. And thank then you I, we do, uh, I think there's the next slide. We do have uh, another webinar planned for uh, April. Um, it really gets to some of what we were talking about earlier about I've been vaccinated, now what? Uh, really to try and help, uh, oh, we can get that back up. Um, it went back to the other slide. Uh, the, uh, to, to really help you as you recover. So we're like April, Friday, April 9th at 3 p.m. Uh, we look forward to hopefully having you all join us again, uh, including you, Gail. Thank you so much again for being here with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you all. We appreciate your advice and guidance. And I want to thank our audience for joining us this morning. And we hope you join us for future webinars, as Dr. Thomas indicated. Again, if you would like to connect with our team one more time, here is that email. It's COVID19consulting at osumc.edu. Thank you all. Be safe. Be well. Go Bucks. Three Thanks, Kip off.